exists to foster sustainable feminist communities, work for social justice, and encourage the expression of diverse and marginalized voices. So I'm very excited to get to introduce these people tonight. I want to begin by saying that we are co-sponsoring this program with our very good friends, the Auburn Avenue Research Library. So we are privileged to work with them on many programs. And as we go along, you may see some notes from them in the chat. If, any, if our authors mention anything that need a link, they'll probably give you a link and you'll be able to access all of that after the program. So you don't need to take notes on it as you go along. Um, another little sort of housekeeping detail is that probably some questions will come up as the conversation is happening. And if you have a question that you would like discussed, go to the ask a question box down, down below these people on the screen and put your question into that. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce first Rachel because this evening is an evening honoring Rachel M. Harper. She is the author of this new book, The Other Mother. It's a novel. I love novels. They're my favorite way to learn anything. And I haven't gotten a chance to read it because you know it just came out today. So we're pretty excited that this is the national book launch for this book. And it is happening with Karis and the Auburn Avenue Research Library. So we're pretty thrilled about that. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything about the book because Rachel and Shay will tell you some things about that. Um, so I have lots of notes on what it actually is all about, but I'm not going to tell you that. Um, I will tell you that, so you have to get to my notes again. Um, Rachel's first book was Brass Ankle Blues, and then she also wrote This, this Side of Providence, which was shortlisted for the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Her work has been nominated for Pushcart Prize. It's been widely published and anthologized. She's received fellowships from Yaddo and McDowell and is on the faculty at Spalding University School of Writing. And she lives in LA and everything else about her that she wants to share with us, she will share as we go along. Thanks. Our other, our conversation partner tonight is our own Shay Youngblood. Um, Shay is also an author of novels, uh, Black Girl in Paris and Soul Kiss and collection of short stories. She's an amazing playwright. She's had lots of essays and plays published and all of that. Um, her short stories have been performed at Symphony Space and recorded for NPR's Selected Shorts. She received her MFA in playwriting from Brown University. I believe Brown plays in this novel as well, which is oh, kind of fun. Um, in her, her current projects, she has a lot of them, y'all, include a novel, some children's books, which we're going to be celebrating at Karis before very long, and um, also an ongoing multimedia performance work on architecture, memory, and the environment, a commissioned play inspired by interviews with over 100 Southern Black women. She's a board member at Yado and a commissioner on the board of the U.S. Japan Friendship Commission, and uh, she has a play happening this summer in our local theater, which is Horizon Theater in Little Five Points. The play is called Square Blues and will be playing from July 8th to August 14th. So if you're in Atlanta or can come to Atlanta, don't miss that. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all that I need to say right now. I will come on at the end and chat with you just a little bit more. But right now, I want to just turn it over to these two fabulous people who are going to let us listen in on their conversation. Rachel, 
Rachel Harper. I want to scream because I am <laughs> so thrilled and so happy um, that you have finished this beautiful novel. I read it. I finished reading it um, about two days ago and I'd been with my family. So it, we really had a lot of resonance for me, uh, with all those big things that you have in there. And it was like, it was like, it was a thriller. It was like reading it. I was like, a, they talk a page turner. It's like, I want to know what happened next. So I have to be really careful in this conversation not to reveal too much. Um, but it's a beautiful novel. And um, I don't know if I can, I've known you long enough to say this, that I am just so proud of you. And I know that you must be really proud of yourself. It is no joke to, you know, slog through a novel and then to do one so well. So I thank you for that. And it's just a privilege and an honor to be here uh, in conversation with you today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. No, it is, uh, it is fantastic for me um, for all of these moments coming together just to finish this book, to have it come out. Um, for those who know me, my students, you know, I've been reading from this book, it's balding um, for years, little snippets here and there talking about it. My colleagues, I mean, it's, uh, it's been a journey, you know, and the life that I was living at the time that I was also writing and trying to make meaning out of the ways in which some of the themes are, you know, autobiographical and certainly emotionally uh, true to, to me in a lot of ways and in interesting ways, not always just the assumed ones. Um, and so I had a lot of life to live while I was working on it and going back and forth. And I, I feel it's a real testament um, to perseverance because, you know, there were really times in my life, like I took big breaks, very different than other books um, that I worked on where, you know, uh, for example, you know, my father passed away in 2016. I had written like two drafts, maybe three. I put the book down. I had to grieve. It was like, I did not go back. It, it, I took at least a year off, um, at least from the book. It was finished. You know, I just needed that distance. I didn't have the objectivity, um, you know, and it was, it was a lot of terrain uh, to deal with. So I think what makes me the most proud is the fact that I remember the difficult moments. Mm -hmm. You know, I like, I was between agents at one point with this manuscript, you know, all the sort of the classic things. Um, how's it going to work out? You know, um, is this a story that needs to be told? Is anyone going to relate to this? You know, um, I didn't share it for the first couple of years that I worked on it. Like no one saw it. Um, and so it feels like it's a big reveal to me right now, having this moment, you know, just having gone through um, the journey behind the scenes with my publishing company, you know, with my editor, with my agent, um, with my wife, who, who was my first editor um, and and supporter, you know, just, just going through draft after draft. So I'm just really grateful, like, to have this here in my hands is, is really, like, wow. Um, and to everybody, you know, my whole team at, at Counterpoint, um, you know, it, it took a lot for us to get it here. And I'm so proud of, of the work everyone's done. And I'm just really excited and hard to believe it's May and it's here already. And it's like, wow, we're having this event after, um, you know, just waiting and dreaming and hoping, uh, you know, it would, it would come to be. And so here we are. And I'm, I'm very happy to get down to business and whatever you want to ask, you know, I'm down to talk about it. I'm with you. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to reveal too much, but I think there's clearly plenty to, to talk about. Oh, um, definitely. Definitely. Lots to talk about this, this, you know, on the flap, if you read the flap copy, we just talked about that, that it, you know, it sets up the scene very nicely. This young, this young man um, is, he goes off to college, first year in college, freshman, uh, he's he's musically very talented. He's a project prodigy, and he is looking for a parent who has died, and he um, believes that you know he's going to find um, information about this parent. But what he does is he opens up a Pandora's box, and it's really what he finds is you know a lot of secrets and family secrets and lies, and and I want to say justified 
you know, everybody <laughs> justified, right? And what I, I love so many things about this book, um, but I love the structure um, of the book. There are seven books and it's from, it's like Rashomon style. In the Japanese film Rashomon, there, you know, there's, there's, there's some really big events that happen in the novel and all these different points, of, it's, it's seen from all these different points of view. And I love how you inhabit all these different characters and you make us, you know, you, we can see from these different points of view. So talk a little bit about the structure, like the, or, or the, the beginning actually of the novel, like what, you know, what kind of inspired you and also a little bit about how you chose the structure. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, the first book, which is the young man's book, um, was not the first book that I wrote when I first, you know, um, started the book. And it was, you know, not the character I, I felt like I knew the most about, but it was the catalyst. So it was, it was interesting how I sort of entered into the story from about how I wanted to really talk about, you know, lesbians, becoming parents and in the time when it was a little bit ahead of time for pe everybody else to be ready for that. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was a little bit, um, I mean, some may say it's still, you know, it's not, I don't know, we can use the word mainstream, but it's much more common now um, than, than when I became a parent and when I started writing about it in terms of this book. So I wanted them to be dealing with that and I wanted a sense of time. Like I think that when I started to think about the key tentpole moments, which was um, Juliet and Marissa and their relationship um, when they were young, some mistakes they made. And then I was thinking about, okay, this baby. And I wanted to then jump forward. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm going to not, I'm, I'm going to start actually in the future in my mind which was after they sort of the relationship falls apart they break up i'm going to jump to the future but actually i should start there and really have the book be sort of going into the past mm -hmm. um which is a little strange maybe um but for me i understood right away that i wanted the different books to follow the different characters in a way that, you know, my second novel also had um, rotating narrators, but it was like chapter by chapter. It was much more like Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Um, oh, uh, this Side of Providence. This Side of Providence, exactly. And, you know, it and it's chronological, but you jump every chapter. And what I wanted with this book was to spend more time with each of the, each of the narrators, each of the voices. Um, but to still have a sense of a complicated picture. And for me, as you know, when I write about family, which is generally, you know, writing about family and loss are two of my big um, subjects, and then trying to sort of recreate uh, either a new family or, or a new idea about family mm -hmm. after loss. That's sort of like, you, you could arguably say all of my novels are about that. Um, and when thinking about that, I was like, okay, I want these different perspectives but I want you to spend enough time with each one that you don't, you don't, you think you're with the, the like correct one, or you, you think, you know, you think you understand the story when you're there mm -hmm. and then you move on and it's like, Oh, and it's like more reveals. And then you're kind of like, okay. And then you move on and you move on. Um, and so as soon as I realized I, I wanted to, to talk from, their fathers, um, because I'm interested in the duality of, you know, it's, it, this book is about a lot of things, but it's, you know, there's mothers and sons, um, mm -hmm. and then there's fathers and daughters, you know, but I'm kind of going up from the, the, the daughters as adults and then the grandfathers and all these roles um, within a family, you know, that, that people play, um, both roles that you're aware of and maybe roles that you're unaware of or, or positions in the family that you uh, wanted to take or didn't want to take, you know? And I think that what ends up happening in the course of the book was something that I felt like with my strange sort of structure of jumping around or moving, moving around, um, 
it would allow each one of them to reveal something to the reader, but not necessarily to each other. You know, everybody in the book does not know, you know, as the reader, you know the most by the end of the book, you know, um, but everyone is has got different secrets from different members. Um, and like you said, for their own reasons. And and I I did want there to be not one clear um, bad guy or one clear um, hero or heroine in a, in a simple sense. I wanted it to be uh, that when you're starting with Jenry, he just feels sort of wrecked because he feels like a big part of his life um, is a lie. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I talked to someone very early on, they were like, but maybe you want to save this till later in the book. And I was like, but you don't understand. There's so many more reveals coming. Like <laughs> this, this is that this can be on the flap copy because this is actually the setup. Um, and in a way, like I'm saying, Jenry and him understanding about Juliet, understanding that he was a product of a lesbian relationship and that, um, you know, Jasper as his father was, was not ever intended to be, it was no love story between Marissa and Jasper. Um, and he was never intending to, uh, you know, to raise him like that. That was a, a lie. But that's really just the beginning of understanding everyone's motivations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I thought that, that the, the structure was a way to, to, to both create tension mm -hmm. and to, to create and establish more compassion for everyone. Because as you move through the, through the book, you, you start to understand why the characters did what they did. And, and in any ways, it was part of my writing process was also understanding that and deep, be, deepening my own compassion for the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, in a lot of my revisions, I was aware of how at the beginning I had played favorites. You know what I mean? I, I had my sense of like who was more of a victim and who was, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it was okay for, for my first draft, you know, as, as like, as I understood the, the players, mm -hmm. but, as they had to kind of grow and evolve um, and have compassion for each other mm -hmm. uh, as, as the book moves forward, I did too. And, and I hope that that is also, you know, coming across in the writing. Cause I, I, I tried to, in revision, I tried to smooth that out um, in terms of sharing the, the storylines. Well, you did a, you did a beautiful job. You created some really complex characters that, that, um, there are, as you said, there are no villains, there are no heroes, there are complex people who are human. They have human emotions and they, you know, they get angry, they feel betrayed, they tell lies and cover things up um, and feel justified in the, you know, in keeping these secrets. Um, we've got, you know, the, the son, we've got the mother, the mother's point of view, the other mother, um, we've got the grandfather's point of view, the other grandfather, um, the father, um, uh, and the other son. It is just, it, it really, um, it's a beautiful tapestry. And looking at these three generations um, in the, across the, in this family and looking at how um, family secrets and lies can really um, wreck relationships. And it, it wrecks them. I mean, they can be repaired, you know, but, you yeah. know, and what I love too about how the way that you um, kind of move through attempting to repair certain things is that forgiveness is also a really big theme in the, in the novel as well. Like, how do you forgive someone who um, has, you know, not told you the truth about who they are? Um, right. And really stolen, like in these cases, you know, I think that both Jenry and Juliet feel as if um, they have been stolen from each other because they've lost so much time together. Um, yes. You know, and, and, and I do think, you know, that's a big one. That's, that's a big one that I had to really understand um, as I was, as I was writing it and, 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 and imagine my way into how that would feel, um, you know, from both sides and, and how you do try sort of forgive, um, you know, people for, for these, you know, major, um, offenses against you, you know, uh, and, and I think that as a theme in my own life, that hasn't always been easy. I think one of the reasons why I tend to kind of write myself into this corner with a lot of my work where I have people doing all these things and then, but that, but I want 
at least if not a happy ending, I want a hopeful ending. So then I have to kind of get my way out of it, you know, work my way out of it without like, you know, violence and other things. Like I, I'm, I'm going for love and connection. Mm-hmm. And yet it's like, wow, how do you forgive? And I think that part of me writing about this is because as a human being in my own life, I, mm-hmm. I have had to uh, really work on my own, you know, ability to forgive. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, you know, everybody knew, like in my family, like I would hold grudges. Like I was really, they were like, so they were like, not you. like, it was just like, I mean, my brother used to like go into my piggy bank and take like my money to go to the bus. And, you know, and I just, I was just so angry, you know, and I was just like, I would hold things. And I really had to work through that um, in my own life. And, and so it, it's, there's nothing like a character you know, your characters and your children, they, boy, they teach you a lot of lessons in life, you know? And so for in this case, my characters really um, helped me grow as a, as a human being. And, and that, you know, it's like went both ways. It's kind of like when I see what they are trying to overcome, then I'm kind of like, okay, you know, I can, I can forgive my brother for stealing money out of my piggy bank, you know? But I look at what, what these folks are doing in my book. Well, you you also what we we met in graduate school many years ago. Well, I shouldn't say graduate school. We were both at Brown University and students when we yeah. met all those years ago. And I can't say that I recognize your genius even then. And yet you wrote this beautiful novel all this much. And I I'm a I'm a witness. I can't take any credit for that. I'm a, I'm a witness to this beautiful blossoming. And I also know that you're a screenwriter and that you studied at USC. And how, how has um, film, because I found the scenes actually very, you know, cinematic. Um, uh, Brown University and Providence are like characters, like major characters in this book. I was back on Thayer Street. Right. <laughs> I was, you know, riding down Hope with you, with, with the character in the car. Mm-hmm. And I, I just felt like I was back there again. So you did a great job of that. So this... Um, y- Talk about a little bit about how how you've been influenced by film, how film has influenced your novel. Or do you think it has? Yes, I definitely do. Um, I, I I take that as a compliment. I appreciate you seeing that in the work. You know, I think um, for me, I do consider myself a pretty visual person, and I do see scenes. Um, I really see, I see them, and I want to sort of paint that picture. And I love. What, what film can do, you know, in terms of images um, and the, the sort of the beauty of images and, and that kind of storytelling. And I think that screenwriting, um, which I'm still, you know, I, I consider myself, I mean, I've, I've, I've got good practice and I've, I've written several, um, you know, screenplays and features and um, TV like pilots and things like that, but I'm still learning and I'm still trying to get better about economy. And I think that economy, which is so important in screenwriting, um, it helps me with my prose, even though I am still, and, and we can, you know, you, you can talk to my editor, Dan, about this, you know, I, I can write lengthy, you know, I, I, I can, I can take a lot, I just like, ooh, I've got space, it's in the novel, I, I just want to keep writing, you know, and I have to be cut back. Um, but believe it or not, you know, even though this novel is just over, uh, you know, 400 pages, I had more to say, you know, I, I'm still aware of compressing and trying to do that within um, my writing and my prose, which I think is, you know, from, from studying that and, and thinking about the essentials of mm-hmm. scene. And, and just like if I'm writing a script, it's like, what is the purpose of this? You know, in a, in a script, there's, it's not just sort of musing. Um, so what can they be doing? You know, what are we seeing if, if there's going to be that? And so I'm very aware of that, even when I have my interior sections, which I love. I mean, that's why I love reading novels and writing novels and fiction. Um, I love when you're getting that interiority in um, a, from a character. And yet I still want it to be um, dramatic and you still want to understand like how are people picturing them what are they doing and and when is there something symbolic that they can be doing um while they're having all these thoughts you know not just something static so it goes both ways i feel like it definitely has helped me um and you bring up 
you know, the Rashomon. And, and I do remember studying that um, in, in graduate school and loving the, not only the multiple perspectives, but exactly what you said, which is the retelling of a specific scene um, and with slight differences. And, and it happens a couple of times in the book. And to me, they were very, very fun to write because I, I understood that I both wanted the reader to recognize. Mm -hmm. So I had some words and, and like partial sentences almost exactly so mm -hmm. that you get, you're like, oh, this is familiar. Wait a minute, I remember this night. And then I wanted some to be different. Um, and I remember when I was working with a copy editor at Counterpoint, he was so sweet because he was like, he was like, now, are, do you realize this is, this is not exactly what she said in the other scene on page, you know? And I was like, yes. And we had a nice back and forth. I said, I, I do, but I'm going for those slight uh, differences in our memory based on, you know, our perceptions and our emotions and how, you know, I swear that I said it this way and then they are like hearing it that way. And so I played with um, things like that in terms of just the dialogue and who did what and those little slights, you know, whether, oh, did, you know, did, did you pull away from me or were you gonna like raise your hand? Were you trying to hit me? And then from their perspective, it's like a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, and I like that, and especially kind of the scenes that I'm thinking about with Juliet and her father and Winston. There's a dramatic scene on the um, on the oh, street yeah. in the rain. Yes. It's so important for both of them um, to 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 really realize that you miss it with when you are are so upset. You miss the moments where the other person might have been willing to be open to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about that, um, you know, all the time. And and so there's a lot that I saw that scene so much in my mind as if it had been shot and I was like watching it back on on the screen because it was like I was just the, the weather and the rain and you know what I mean like I'm definitely thinking you know which I think many you know writers are, are doing that those sensory details what I'm talking about like when I'm in class and you know with my students the the richness that you get when you're thinking about it on every level like that um mm -hmm. it's the same thing that makes us love you know films and shows and stuff when when we feel like we can taste it, you know what I mean? We can we can smell something coming off the screen because it's so potent. Mm -hmm. And that scene that you mentioned too in the rain, that's exactly what I was thinking of. That There was a moment because I was reading it, I was uh, on a bus trip uh, and I was reading it on the bus and, and I just, the, the world fell away. And that's what I aspire to as a writer, to write something where people, someone is reading the book and they're so involved that the world falls away. And so that was a scene in which it was like being inside of the book, inside of the movie and like seeing it like a film. So thank you for that. And I, I'd love, I, I think that I would like to hear you read um, from the book, like to oh, hear, okay. we've been talking all about it. So let's, let's see what you got. Okay. Yes. Let me get my glasses. Cause you know, I can't do anything without these anymore. Um, Okay, I thought that I would read um, from the beginning of book three, which is called The Other Mother. Mm -hmm. um, so it's Juliet's section. And this is the moment um, when she first sees Jenry. He, he has shown up at the restaurant where she's working and out of the blue, she has had no warning. Um, and this is, this is how it happens. Okay, so book three, The Other Mother, chapter one. Standing in the dim light of the restaurant, Juliet recognizes her son instantly, even though she hasn't seen him in more than 16 years. Jenry was just over two years old that final time asleep in the crib she'd assembled a week before his birth, wearing his favorite penguin pajamas. She's thought of that day often over the years, almost daily in fact, but in this moment, now that he's in front of her, she feels as if she'd imagined that scene and has been replaying someone else's memory all these years. Feet peeking through the slats, curls damp against his forehead, how his mouth was slightly opened like he was about to speak. It all comes back to her, 
in that first instant. He is taller than she would have imagined, at least six feet, which makes him several inches taller than her brother, almost the height of her father. His hair is shaved close to the scalp, so there are no curls to recognize, but his nose is the same, a button like his mother, and he still has those ridiculously deep dimples. She has longed for this moment, but now that it's here, she doesn't know what to do, how to be. Her mind races, though her body stands still. The timing is terrible. Her staff is about to arrive for the dinner rush, and she has to prep the duck for tonight's special, mix a, mar a, mar a marinade for pickled beets, and whip four pounds of cream cheese into a frosting for the spice cake baked this morning. But none of that matters. This moment is his. He looks around the room, scanning every corner. I'm looking for Juliet, he says. The sound of her name coming from his mouth startles her. She doesn't know what to say, how to speak even. He hands her a business card, but she doesn't take it. She has forgotten how to move. The next thing she knows, they are talking, but she can't really hear their voices. She is underwater, a swimmer looking up through the choppy surface above, seeing only the dappled light, the image of the sun in double, stretching and bending like a bright bubble in the clouded sky. They are talking about the past, what he already knows, and what he wants her to tell him, beginning with the truth. She knows there is no such thing. There is what she remembers and what she did, what they both did. The truth is complicated, she begins. For years, I didn't know it myself. She has a faint desire to laugh from the absurdity of it all and from the blissful relief of waiting years for something to happen and finally having it occur. I was young, selfish. I thought it would always be there for me whenever I was ready. It meaning you, your mother, the family we created. He nods his jaw, he nods his head, jaw clenched. The one you didn't want. Is that what she told you, that I didn't want you? He doesn't answer, but she can see it on his face. Marissa's version of the story, coloring his body like a pigment. She wants to deny it, defend herself, but realizes it's better to wait. Let him go first. His anger is not greater than hers, but it's closer to the surface. So she allows him to dip into it, wetting his hands. She listens as he talks about his mother, how Juliet left her and left him behind. And it's like plunging her hands into the well, soaking her body with a rage she thought she buried long ago. But it doesn't look like rage. It looks like heartache. The loss of him fills her body, courses through her veins. And now, as her memories replay over and over, she can't help but feel it all. The sadness, the loss, the love she had and perhaps still has for him, flowing into her limbs, making her skin twitch, her fingers ache till it spills from her eyes as tears. She sees his own eyes fill as he says he doesn't understand why did you let her take me away from you? He asks, voice trembling. If you really believed I was your son. All right, I'm gonna stop there. That's in the middle of the scene, but it's, it's, it's also a very tender love story. And it's a heartbreaking journey. And, and it's also very hopeful. So all of those things, all of those things. I can I can just talk all day about how wonderful it is. Thank you. This book is beautiful. I'm wearing blue to match the book today. Happy, <laughs> Happy first first day book. Um, and I, ha I and I, I do want to get to questions. Um, I hope that people will ask questions. I will look down in the chat and see if other people have questions for you. But one of the um, uh, uh, three of the main characters are exceptional artists, and I thought you captured really well um, the the anguish and the. Um, the highs and lows of being a creative artist, the self-doubt, and also the, by, I'll do it by any means necessary, whatever it takes to get it done, and how we are so identified 
with with the work as well. Um, and I was going to ask how you maintained a healthy balance between, you know, being a teacher, a mother, an artist, um, a parent, family member, a friend. How do you how do you do that? Um, I'm still a work in progress. You know, I definitely do not think I have all the answers. It is it is an ongoing uh, journey with that for sure. Um, I think the thing that I know most of all is that the balance is necessary, even though I often overshoot it or under, you know what I mean? I'm like going for the balance and then it's like, oop, a little too much, not enough. Um, and I think that, you know, as far as my kids, thankfully kids are forgiving, you know, and at different times, you know, I, I know that I sacrifice for them when they're little. And then at other moments I turn around and I'm like, okay, guys, like, you know, I really need to go down and like get back to my revisions and, and, you know, can, can you guys do this without me? Can you be okay? Um, you know, and they, they've been on the journey with me. Um, but, but the balancing, you know, the, the artist and the regular life has definitely been something that I've thought about. I've been interested in, I've been, you know, reading artist biographies, you know, memoirs and stuff since I wanted to become a writer in my 20s um, because I'm always looking for clues like how, you know, how do people do it? You know, does anybody have the right idea here? Um, and I definitely, I think that support in whatever way that you can um, is really important, um, not only in partners, which, you know, I've been grateful to have over the years that the support of of partners, of co-parents, of family members, grandparents, you know, friends and neighbors. Um, you know, some of my closest friends haven't had children, so it's they step up um, in different ways, and that's been great and been really helpful. Um, but I definitely, you know, that I wanted to write about, um, you know, in making in making them artists. I wanted to write about that that drive um, and how for both. Jasper, who decided early on, um, you know, as a ballet dancer, not to have children um, and and got to live a certain life because of it and reach a certain level. Um, you know, Jenry, who's just starting out and is incredibly sort of driven, but also wants to have a fuller life. I think his mom is not an artist in terms of Marissa having raised him, but he sees that he she kind of gave up a lot of her life for him to be a mom now what he doesn't know is part of it was because of being closeted and and her journey um you know that we get to understand more of um in book two when she starts to tell us things that he didn't know about um about you know his own his own childhood um and then you have juliet you know who had tried to be an artist and then um, sort of lost her way, you know, um, wanted to be a mom. And at the time when those two things sort of converged for her, um, she was struggling with authenticity and, and telling the truth in her actions and um, sort of trying to figure out the line between what she was saying and what she was doing and how she felt. Um, and it was muddled, you know, and she was young and a little bit confused. And, and I related to that um, in my own 20s you know, of having big dreams about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be, and yet not always having that play out in my actual relationships and how I treated people and how I, or even like my own dreams, you know, sometimes it's like, I, I remember being like, you know, in graduate school, like I want to write and I was doing this, but then I was like up till three in the morning, like eating sausages with friends and making cocktails on the, and being and, and just being like, what? Like I want to do this. And then I'm like self-destructive over here and a little bit wild. Um, and so, you know, it takes what it takes. It takes some time. Um, and I think that's okay. And, and I think, you know, for Juliet, part of her story, as she as an older in her forties looks back, is to also forgive herself. You know, she has a couple people to forgive in the book um, mm -hmm. because of what they did and that's her journey. But mm -hmm. actually she also has to really forgive herself. Yes. And um, that's a piece that I didn't understand as I as I was starting it, as I was structuring it back to that question. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking, about, 
you know, I kind of set it all up as, as these trios, you know, where it's like, okay, Marissa and Juliet and Jenry, they're like a trio. And then Juliet's family of origin, you know, her dad, her brother and her are a trio. Um, and, and then when Juliet and, and Marissa break up and she takes him and then she and her family become another trio she and her father and, and, and Jenry because they become close. And there's all these little trios, but, and I wanted to kind of, to find the tension, pit people against each other and pit situations against each other. And I started to realize with Juliet, I was like, Juliet is really hard on herself. And she, one of her things is actually work to, to look back at that younger self mm -hmm. and give that she didn't know everything and that she was selfish and she didn't know how to ask for what she needed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really relate to that. And I think that when I look at my kids and, you know, as they're just the older ones crossing into adulthood, uh, you know, we're having conversations about that because I, I wish that people had been talking to me about it in the same way that I'm trying to now do differently. Because I'm like looking at, oh, you know, you make a lot of assumptions when you're a young person, kind of like how to be an adult, how to be in the world um, and how to show up for other people and what that means in relationships. Um, and sometimes I think people think that the way to do it better is to like move on. Like, you know, you, you break up and then you just go to a new one. And, you know, as we know, if you're not fundamentally solving your own, like whether it be a communication problem or something, you're just going to keep repeating that, you know, um, in terms of patterns and, and your, relationships and I'm trying to break that for Juliet which is a big storyline in the present too because she has a new partner um and you know they want to have a family like she wants to do it differently and can she and that 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 facing herself and and be, being like can I trust myself mm -hmm. um what did I do you know what am I responsible for um who who can I blame and she's she's blaming a lot of other people until she comes to that moment of realizing realizing that she also bears the responsibility um, too. And, I, and, and that was an important part for me of, the, of her journey and to put it in there in the, in the book as well. Well, I, I have so, I have many, many more questions, but there are, is an audience. I, I'm gonna come to LA so we can, you know, go to that secret place we go to and eat those secret things that we eat. <laughs> yes, we aren't gonna tell anybody about That's that. Right. Mm -mm. No, we're gonna, but we're gonna do that and we're gonna just, chat and catch up and but here there people have questions and i'm going to okay. read the first one um this is from yeva john yeva johnson uh as a new reader to rachel m harper is it recommended to read the other novels first as it sounds like they're connected right or can it be in any order i love this discussion thank you um so um brass ankle blues um this side of providence other other mother that's a great question. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to have you here. They can be read in any order. Um, they are not, they are not um, connected in the sense of the actual characters showing up in any of the other books. So each book is, is just its own story. I think what uh, I was saying that may have been confusing was that I think how I relate to my story and my themes I'm often writing about family, I'm writing about loss, and I'm inspired by some of my own history. Um, like a lot of fiction writers, I think, you know, we are telling deep truths by covering it in fiction. Um, so there's different parts of my own story um, in interesting ways in all of my books, but you definitely can read them in any order. Um, you know, I think that I've tried to challenge myself and grow as a writer, as an artist through um, practice, like, you know, we all need to, and, and I'm always practicing and always growing. And I know that I had the idea for this book many years ago, and I knew that I needed to um, grow into being able to write it. Mm -hmm. And both emotionally, mm -hmm. like I've been talking about, as far as those, those ideas, those themes of, of forgiveness and really being able to look at all of the characters with deep compassion and understanding, not just the ones that I feel like I understand because it's more similar to something maybe I did or wanted or lost or whatever. Um, but also in terms of writing, you know, and my first novel 
um, only had one narrator, you know, it was a first person, um, you know, it was a coming of age story. And that was what I could do at the time, you know, with the skills I had, with my understanding, um, I, I, I could just like follow one person's mind and then sort of write the story. And then with the, the next one, with this side of Providence, I, I wanted to expand that because I felt that telling a family story from just one person is limited by definition and can still obviously be, be very successful. But I wanted to open that up a little bit. And then I, I wanted to open it again with this book in a different way with like we were talking about with the structure and also moving through time, you know. So with this one, you know, we do move back and forward and in, into two different time periods and we keep coming back to the present. Um, and that's sort of our anchor. Um, but then you you go backwards in ways that hopefully, you know, sort of uh, um, elucidate the rest of the story. And I just I needed to to develop more, I think, as a as a writer before I could have pulled that off and just sort of held all of, the, of, of those stories and the people in their minds, you know, their hearts. Um, so I'm glad, even though it's, you know, it's taken me a long time to get here. I'm glad on this side, I can look at having put in that time and feeling like, okay, it's, it was worth it. You know, the, the work is on the page. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great answer. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> at Jody Lisberger, has a question. What advice would you most I'm sorry. your people in the house, right? <laughs> what yes. advice would you most like to give mothers that may, and it's actually, it's, this Sunday is Mother's Day, right? Yes. I'm so excited. You're such a great mom, by the way. Um, what advice would you most like to give mothers that maybe you wouldn't have given as advice when you first became a mother? And would there be different advice for lesbian mothers? Interesting. Um, thank you, Liz Berger. Um, I would say the advice I would give now um, as a mom and, and would be to, especially with artists, but I would say for any mom, is to, is to be okay being selfish in the right times. That, that to try to find that balance, but, but I think that I thought at one point when I was younger that being a mom was was a real deep level of sacrifice. Um, and I think in, you know, some like in, in terms of the family I grew up in, you know, I had two parents, I had a father and mother. It was a very um, sort of uh, old fashioned, uh, you know, dynamic as far as like, who worked out of the house, my mom worked at home, she had other things she did, but you know, and when that happens, it feels like the, the, the mother gets a lot of the feeling of putting their life off um, for the kid. And I think that, that there can be a balance, obviously it depends on what you wanna do. I, I have a lot of friends and family who wanted to leave work when they became moms, you know, wanted to take off that time. And if that's what you wanna do, absolutely like i i think you should really follow your gut but i know for someone like me um i wanted to be with my kids and i wanted to write and and for me when i went too long without writing it wasn't good for anybody um because you know it's sort of like my own dissatisfaction with not having enough of that alone time um and that imagination time um, you know, it risks sort of coming out in, in other moments with the kids where you're not fully present or, you know, um, or you feel resentful or with your partner, you know, and that's not good. It's better to just sort of admit like, hey, this is what I need. Um, and it could just be small moments too. I think the other thing I didn't realize is I kind of had an all or nothing mentality as opposed to realizing like little moments, just like that little hour you can take for yourself after work before you come home sometimes and maybe you know find someone else to pick up your kids or a partner or something and just just take a little bit of that time and don't feel guilty about being selfish um because i think a lot of mothers struggle with that of feeling like if they don't fully you know sort of abandon themselves to their kids um that they're not truly like loving them and they're not good mo mothers in that way um, and I think that that standard 
especially when we compare fathers to mothers. Um, you know, a lot of times it's crazy. Like I have some cousins um, that are, are fathers and they all the time, they're just like, you guys, the standard for mothers, they're like, it's so crazy. You guys feel like if you're not like with them and making like a great gourmet meal and you've done other things, you know, they're like, with dads, uh, you know, if I just like fed them, it doesn't matter what, my wife's just like, you are amazing, <laughs> you know? So, and they're just like, why you should be the same, you know? They're my generation. So they're just like, I don't understand why you feel like you're worrying about feeding them and it has to be super nutritious and affordable. They're just like, the kids are fed, I'm one, you know? And and I try to incorporate some of that too. I'm like, yes, I, I like the way that, that this generation, my, my generation of dads are really doing it. Um, way more present than a lot of our fathers were when I was growing up, um, but also not to the point of like injuring themselves as far as feeling like, you know, they're not doing enough. Um, and the last bit of, of that question, Lisberger, you know, I don't think, when I think of the difference between lesbian parents and or lesbian mothers and, and uh, heterosexual mothers or bisexual mothers, to me, it's it's the, the mothering is the same, but the dynamic of the relationship between the partners, or if you don't have a partner, obviously, you know, that's that's different. And and for me, I think the challenge was both uh, thinking about society and and their like the ideas that other people are going to impose on your family and your kids and like going into schools and 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 thinking about your kids being comfortable um, with your family and our, and advocating for your family and not feeling um, discriminated against and feeling proud and you know and they can have their their moments um, dealing with that feeling like they want to be closeted sometimes and you know and just we talked a lot about that with my kids throughout their lives because you don't just have one conversation and then it like never comes up again. Um, you know, and it's just like, you know, we love ourselves, you know, and then they're fine. It's like, sometimes they're like really confident and comfortable and other times they're a little bit shy with it um, as they develop and as they feel the temperature of their friends or, you know, schools and communities and, and navigating that um, is, is, is important. And that's where I would say, I feel that the differences are, are just, try to be in touch with what's realistic, what you believe in, but also try not to put too much of that pressure on your kids. I know that um, I wanted my kids to be proud of our family and to feel comfortable, to feel like they're, they don't have nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing wrong with how we made our family. But I also had to understand that my children do not have to be advocates for me. Like they, they don't have to be at like activists mm -hmm. out there said that to them you know this is this is what we believe that you've seen how i've raised you how i've taken care of you but you know i trust that you understand something about us but if, if there are moments when you're you know with people on the street and you're worried about being looked at in certain ways and you don't have to be like waving your rainbow flag in that moment and that doesn't mean you hate us or you're embarrassed about us you know i was embarrassed about my parents all the time throughout childhood and you know they were a straight couple but it's like they had their own quirks and issues so i get that and, and to try not to be too super sensitive um as, as far as those expectations of of your kids because you know we're, we're learning and growing as as you know we went along all of us are you know you know when you're the difference between your first kid and your second kid you know to me is often very different you know, your own standards, you know, about yourself and what it's going to be like and how you're going to be. We're all just evolving. And, you know, I think just to be kind, kind to yourself um, is to me yeah. great <laughs> advice to all of us on so many times, especially now, you know, what, we're, what we've all been through with the pandemic and stuff. And if you've had kids at home during this time, it's been very challenging for all of us, regardless of, you know, mm -hmm you know, your economic situation, your education, it's its just been challenging. So we all have to have to be kind. And as long as we're showing up, you know, doing the best we can, I, I'm, I hope it's enough. Mm -hmm. Well, be kind, be generous, buy copies of this book for all the mothers, all the sisters, all the brothers, <laughs> buy this yes. book, take it home, <laughs> lost in it.
Rachel, thank you. This has been a pleasure. I, there are many more questions in the chat, but I think our time is coming to an end. So um, I okay, yes, lost track of time. Yeah. Oh, no. It's Yeah, that, that happens. So yeah. Linda is going to come back and she has some things to say, but I am just thrilled that we got to have this, this conversation. Thank you so much for writing that beautiful book. Uh, and Thank again, you. congrats. I'll be raising a glass to you this evening um, and uh, for the duration of, of, of this month and throughout. Yes, the I'll take the whole month. It's like my, my book tour month. So I'm, I'm loving it. I do the same when it's my birthday. It's like you get the whole month. I exactly. think you taught me that, Shay. A perpetual I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. <laughs> Have a birthday anytime you want, baby. <laughs> It's been wonderful. And thank you so, again. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Karis Books. And yeah. So folks, let me also say thank you to the whole crowd for being here, for choosing to be part of this evening yes. with us. Mm -hmm. This was a tough, tough day in our world and in the news. And um, in the midst of all of that distress and need for action and all that that means to many of us to have a chance to come together, talk about relationships, talk about love, talk about forgiveness, mm -hmm. talk about um, creativity and imagination time, all mm -hmm. of that. That's really important too. It's what sustains us and gives us the strength to keep doing the work. So um, Shay has invited you to buy the book. There's a little teal button right beneath Shay on the screen that says buy the other mother. Yes. And um, oh, in, in case you don't know, it makes a big difference to independent bookstores and to Karis Books and more that you buy your books from us and keep us going so that we can continue to do the justice work that we're talking about and the support of creativity and the support of writers um, and the support that this community means. Let me quickly say that there's a whole calendar of stuff going on with Care Circle. You can look at that whole calendar online. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Rachel. I am so happy that you read something because I could hear all the story and how important that was in your conversation, but when you read, I could see what kind of a writer you are and I could see that it's beautiful work and that Thank it is you. worth taking the time to read those 400 pages and to get that deeper and more nuanced and complex and beautiful experience of the story. So thank you for that. Thank you to thank Shay you so always and always. So good night, everybody. See you next time. Good night. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shay. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.